We're here today to speak with one of the contributors to our new book, How to Heal Our Divides. Rabbi Rami Shapiro is an award-winning author of over 36 books on religion, spirituality, and recovery. Rami co-directs the One River Foundation. He's a contributing editor with Spirituality and Health Magazine. He hosts two podcasts, Essential Conversations with Robbie Rami and Conversations on the Edge, a weekly and a weekly Zoom talk called Roadside Assistance at the corner of, I'm probably not going to pronounce this right, Tohu of Vavohu. Yeah, pretty good. Which means wild and chaos. <laughs> And he is the 2020 recipient of the Huston Smith Award for Excellence in Interspiritual Education. So, Rami, it's so wonderful to have you involved in this project and to have you join us today. Well, thank you very much for you know, having me do this, both uh, the chapter in the book and this conversation with you. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, to seeing where you want this to go. Sure, sure. So, uh, well, I briefly touched on your background, but you've done so many different things. Can you talk about it a little bit further? Yeah, I mean, you really covered it. I, I mean, work-wise, I was 20 years as a congregational rabbi. Then I left that to focus on my, I guess, first love, which is writing, though I've published a number of books during those 20 years. But when I left the congregation, I had a lot more time to write, and so I ended up writing a lot of things. Um, my interests are Judaism, recovery, you know, 12-step recovery, and what I call perennial wisdom, uh, which falls under the category of, oh, I don't know, mysticism, spirituality, that, that kind of thing. And I don't know what else I can say about that. I mean, that's, that's what I do. I, I'm a contributing editor with Spirituality and Health Magazine. I do their podcast, Essential Conversations. I run, I, I write their, I guess you call it what, like a spiritual advice column every issue of the print magazine, and I write uh, two essays a month for the digital side of the, the, the magazine. So, I mean, I write. Luckily, with the pandemic locking me in the house, <laughs> it didn't really impact uh, my, my writing. In fact, it said, oh, I don't have to travel and talk about what I write. Now I can just sit here and write. Just more. gives you more time to be more so, prolific. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, prolific. As long as we're not talking, we're talking quantity rather than quality. Absolutely, this is this has been good for the quantity part. Well, I mean, you've certainly written books that you know have been highly acclaimed for their quality as well. Well, I've won a bunch of awards and stuff like that, but you know, I I, I never know if the books. I, I guess I won't know if the books have any real lasting value until I'm long dead. <laughs> so, and then there's no there's no way to know so well let's not hope that's anytime soon so uh yeah thank you appreciate that <laughs> so if, if people are not familiar with your books what would be you know a couple that you would point them to today well again in those three areas that i write about i would and i'm just picking titles in a sense because my jewish titles are there's a lot of them but if you wanted to grasp my philosophy of Judaism, there's a very thin book called Open Secrets. And it purports to be letters between my grandfather and his Rebbe, his uh, Hasidic master. Uh, but it's not. I mean, it's, I, I wrote the book. It's <laughs> You're Hasidic imagining the conversation. I, I imagine the conversation. It's actually, I wrote them it's a series of letters. I wrote these letters to my son. I was, and, and I drew from Hasidic teachings that I find meaningful, but my grandfather was simply a literary conceit that I put in the book. And it's, it's supposed to be, I mean, the ideas aren't fictional, but the, con, the concept of the book is, is a fictional book. Unfortunately, and, and by, it really took me by surprise, no one got the fact that it was fiction. <laughs> and that book took on a life of its own. I, I've self-published it just for my congregation as a teaching tool. And, you know, again, for my kid. But people took it, translated it into different languages. It's been published uh, all over the place in, what do you call it? I guess, Airsatz, you know, editions. They're, they're not officially 
condoned. I was many years ago teaching at a church and I went in their bookstore and they had copies of a edition of it that I had no idea even existed. And people would write me and say, is this true? And I say, well, the ideas are true, but no, it's fiction. It's, it's clearly fiction. In fact, in one edition of the book, it says, this is fiction. <laughs> but you know, people, people just assumed it was, it was a nonfiction book. So that sort of lays out open secrets. That lays out my philosophy of Judaism. Uh, in recovery, I have two books and I think they have to be read in tandem. The, the first one is called Recovery, the Sacred Art, and it's an interfaith look at 12-step. I believe that uh, Bill Wilson's creation of the 12 steps, while it works for addicts, certainly, I, I, I have no question about that. I think it works for those who do not necessarily consider themselves a, uh, you know, addicts of one sort or another. He said, Wilson said, uh, first, we have to stop playing God. And to me, that's the ultimate addiction that all humans share, that we think we're in control, we try to be in control, we, you know, we strive to control others in order to maintain our illusion of control. 12-step can be used, I think, to free you from that. So my first book on 12-step on uh, as a spiritual practice went through all 12 steps. And then, and I'm, I'm in a program myself, so over the years of being in a program, I realized that there's, I really wanted to explore the idea of surrender because I don't believe in it. Uh, so, so I wrote a book called Surrendered, making it passive. If in fact, I am powerless over my addiction, which is the premise of recovery, 12-step recovery. If in fact, I'm powerless over my addiction, then I'm powerless to turn my addiction over to my higher power. If I could do that, I wouldn't be an addict. I don't have that control. I cannot surrender to a higher power, but I can be surrendered to it. And I would just say two other things about that. One is I don't like the word higher power. I prefer the word greater power, though I use higher power so because everyone does. But I think greater is better. Higher sounds like there's you over here and there's a, a super power being above you, separate from you. I don't, that's not my theology. My theology is that we are all part of this greater reality. So I like greater power better than higher power. And then the, the notion that we are surrendered by the addiction itself, by hitting rock bottom. That's the grace of I don't know what you want to call it, the grace of the, the greater power or the grace of the addiction is that it shatters your illusion of control. And in that shattering, you have an opportunity to be surrendered and the liberation, not only from whatever addiction you're wrestling with, but the liberation from the need or the addiction to play God, that comes really from being shattered or crucified um, or what, 12 step calls, you know, hitting, hitting rock bottom. So those two books go together. And then the third um, area of interest is what I call perennial wisdom. And perennial wisdom, it's also called uh, perennial philosophy. Uh, it's the idea that if you go to the mystic heart of the world's religions, you always find the same core truths being articulated. And, and it's not and these truths are discoverable by the individual, by you and I, right? You, you can test these out in your own life through contemplative practices of one sort or another. They're not based on tradition. They're not based on uh, a holy book. You know, even though there there are traditions involved and there are holy books involved, they're based on your own experience. So. The way I articulate it, there are four perennial wisdom, four points to perennial wisdom. The first one is that everything is a manifesting of a non-dual reality that people call by many names. So you can call it God or Brahman or Dharmakaya or nature, mother. I mean, there's just, you know, Tao, there's a, a length a lengthy list of names that people have invented for this 
singular not or this non-dual reality. The, the metaphor, the best metaphor for this first point is that you, you think of this reality as an infinite ocean and everything in creation, you and I, the computers we're using, everything that exists, uh, everything is a wave of that ocean. So that's why I like the idea of greater power. The ocean is greater than the wave, but it's not higher than the wave. So point one is we're all part of this singular reality. Point number two is that human beings, and maybe others, I don't know, but human beings have the innate capacity to know this to be true. You can awaken to this greater power in, with, and as yourself. The third is that there's an ethical component to awakening. When you awaken to this greater reality of which you're a part, you're called to, well, the way the Bible puts it is to, in, in Genesis 12, 3, the Bible says to, that you're called to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. So when I recognize that all the families of the earth means everything that exists, that all of, the, uh, that all of creation is, an, is part of uh, this greater reality, including myself, so that it's, they're all sisters and brothers, everything is my sister or brother, that I have this obligation to be a blessing toward you know, all beings. And you, know, you're, uh, you could say your, your spiritual compass for that is maybe the golden rule that sets you on the path of, of uh, at least in the Jewish way and the Confucian way of putting it is what's hateful to you don't do to somebody else. So that's the third point. So it has this ethical component. And then the fourth point is, awakening to this greater reality and engaging your, or using your life to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, that's, those two things comprise your highest calling as a human being. So I, I hopefully I articulated that clearly. No, it's very clear. It's, and it's then I've, I, I've um, written, a, and I've written a book called Perennial Wisdom for the Spiritually Independent, uh, for those who are interested in this. And then there is a follow-up to that called the World Wisdom Bible, which just gives you more texts to make to, to demonstrate that uh, every religion has these common elements when you get beneath the theological surface. You know, you know I mean, that's the struggle is on, from the surface perspective, and I tried to deal with this in my article for the book, from the surface perspective, every religion seems unique and distinct. You know, either God has a son or God doesn't have a son. There's not a lot of wiggle room there. If God has a son, Judaism's false, Christian, uh, uh, Islam is false, Hinduism, Buddhism, right? They, they, don't, they don't say that. If God doesn't have a son, Christianity is false. Or at least those aspects of or those denominations that rely on the, the Trinity and God having a child. So it's an either or thing. But if you go deeper into any given religion and you get beyond those surface differences, you find something else going on. And that's what, you know, what, what I'm calling this uh, perennial wisdom. So say the name of the first perennial wisdom book that you mentioned again, please. So the first one is perennial wisdom for the spiritually independent. And okay. I can define yeah. that term if you want. And the other one is the world wisdom Bible. Wonderful. Wonderful. So out of all of that work has come the one river foundation. Can you talk a little bit about how that got started? Yeah, One River was an attempt to, or is an attempt to promote perennial wisdom and the idea of being a blessing. I mean, that's really all it does. So we run a variety of programs it, it, just to see what works <laughs> to get this message out. So I, I do retreats, you know, this is pre-COVID. I would run weekend retreats. Now we're, we do them on Zoom, um, which is a very different beast altogether. But we would do retreats, we did uh, classes, we do some, uh, I, I, I try to do a perennial version of different holy days. So we did the, the 10 days of from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur in the Jewish calendar. We did a 10 day retreat, you download most of it. So you listen to it privately. And then you come on Zoom uh, a couple of times to, to engage with the people who are doing the retreat. We do a Monday night program where people can just dial in. I, I mean, I could go through the list. It's not going to, people won't, won't register, but you could find out what One River does at uh, oneriverfoundation.org and you can see the calendar. It's pretty full. Very cool. Very cool. 
So um, in the chapter for uh, how to heal our divides, you talk about the three shifts for healing religious divides. Can you discuss those with us? Yeah, what I have in mind is you have to change the mindset if you're going to heal these religious divides. If you, I, I think it's Einstein who said, you know, if, you, if you try to solve the problem with the same mindset that created it, is that Einstein or Freud? Now I don't remember. You, you can't solve the problem. You need a new mindset. And so I looked for, or I, I articulated in that chapter, three shifts that um, you and I, you know, humans have to make in order to see the perennial wisdom at the heart of, of all of our diverse traditions. And I'll get to them in a second, but I just want to make sure I'm not saying you should get rid of your tradition. I mean, if you like your tradition, <laughs> I remember when Obama said, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. It turned <laughs> out he may not have been telling the whole truth. But <clears throat> if you like your religion, you can keep your religion and make these three shifts within the context of that religion and then discover the perennial at its heart. So the first shift is moving from belief to hypothesis. So belief, in my mind, belief is affirming as true something for which you have no evidence, right? So I would never say, I would never say, I believe I have a sister. Right? I know I have a sister. I might say, I believe my sister is at home doing X, Y, or Z, but I don't know that to be true. So I say, I believe that, but I don't believe that my sister exists. I know my sister exists. The problem with belief is there's no way to prove it. So when you affirm a belief as a fact, then you're stuck upholding something you can't prove. And if you're attached to that, then you can't move on. You can't, you can't even question your own affirmation. If it's a hypothesis, it's open to testing. So does God have a son or not, right? So if, you, if you're a Christian and you simply say, I believe God has a son, which means I affirm God has a son, I don't wanna discuss it, then there's, there is no room for discussion. But if you say, my hypothesis is God has a son, and then you're willing to go into a questioning mode where you investigate, well, what does that mean and how might that happen? Then you find yourself in the world of Christian mystics. And then you find yourself in the world of the perennial. And you'll, you'll find uh, the notion that, that God's son slash, uh, or yeah, I guess you could say slash daughter, you know, is, is the universe in a sense. And you, and you find that Christ is more a state of mind than uh, an individual named Jesus from the town of Nazareth. So by making these things hypotheses, you can free yourself from your own um, blinders, right? I mean, I'm clearly biased against belief, so you know I, I know that. But you can free yourself from that, and you don't have to, to prove it or defend it. You can simply explore it, and then the idea is the deeper you go, the more you find yourself in the universal teachings of perennial wisdom. Did, did that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the second one is shifting, shifting from uh, metaphysics to metaphor. Now, this is very similar. Uh, when, well, if we have time, let me, let me tell you a story. This is the best way to get sure. at this. I few years ago was leading a retreat, an interfaith trip uh, to what, what the, uh, they called it the Holy Land, you know, to Israel, Palestine. And the idea was, I went with my friend, uh, Gordon Pierman, who's a teacher of Buddhist, you know, within a Buddhist lineage, but also an Episcopal priest. And we went to explore the, uh, to explore Judaism and Christianity and Islam though our Muslim teacher had to back out at the last minute. So it was really mostly Judaism, Christianity, but to explore them while we wandered through, you know, the places where the stories happened. And we're visiting what's called uh, the garden tomb, which is a, 
an alternative, you know, most Christianities say that Jesus was crucified in what is now the Holy Sepulchre, Church of the Holy Sepulchre within the walls of the old city of Jerusalem. But the Protestant uh, denominations led by the Anglican Church argue that the Jesus's tomb is not within the walls of the city or within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which has the place of the crucifixion, then you can also go to the place of the burial, but in a garden tomb outside the old city. And it's a beautiful park. It's a beautiful place and you can go. It's open to, to tourists. And when you go, you, you go and they assign you an Anglican guide who makes sure you visit the place within the context of the Anglican church. Our guide was incredibly pompous, I thought, and misunderstood our entire interfaith mission. And <clears throat> from the first 30 seconds, insulted Jews, Muslims, and Catholics. <clears throat> I kept trying to intervene and I realized I was losing my cool. You know, I was gonna end up in a fight with this guy and that was gonna ruin what should otherwise have been an incredible opportunity to see what may have been Jesus's tomb in this in this garden. So I excused myself from the tour. I let the guy go off with, with the people that I was uh, leading and I went and found a private place to sit and meditate. I'd been there before, I loved the place. It's just powerful for me. Anyway, so I'm sitting, I'm meditating. <clears throat> and then I hear this voice, it's a woman's voice. And in Judaism, that's called a bat kol. You hear the voice of God and it's called the daughter's voice. So I'm sitting there and I hear this voice and the voice says, are you the rabbi? And I'm sitting there, it's a bat kol. It's the divine, you know, my eyes are closed. It's the divine voice. Yes, yes, I am the rabbi. <laughs> you know, I open my eyes. It's just another guide who's <laughs> come over. She heard that I had a problem with the guide assigned to my group. She came over to talk to me, make sure I was okay and that everything was fine. So I lost my little, you know, narcissistic, it's God talking to me. And then she asked me what is called in the literature, C.S. Lewis's di uh, trilemma. So C.S. Lewis, very famous uh, Christian author, gave a series of lectures over BBC during World War II to try to lift up the spirits of the people. And one of the things he came up with is, is something that has come to be called C.S. Lewis's trilemma. And he says, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me, is Jesus lying? Is he a lunatic? Or is he Lord? So this uh, Anglican guide asked me this put the same thing to me. You know, <clears throat> what are you going to say about, about Jesus? Is he lying? Is he a lunatic? Or is he the Lord? C.S. Lewis assumed that nobody would say he's lying and nobody would say he's insane. So you're left with affirming that Jesus is God. So she thought she had me, I guess. And I said, you know, I reject the limits of the question. I think there's a fourth alternative. And to her credit, she was... She'd never heard of that before. And she said, okay, so what's the fourth alternative? And I said, Jesus is a God intoxicated mystic who understood that in fact, all of us, when, especially when we awake to this Christ consciousness or this, uh, you know, uh, this divine mind, in Judaism it's called spacious mind, mohin de godlut. When you awaken to that mind and you realize everything is God, then you can say as almost as, as dozens of great mystics in dozens of different traditions have said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not I, Jesus, the egoic uh, mind, the narrow mind, mochin, the uh, cottonwood of Jesus, but the cosmic mind, the Christ mind, the, you know, the Buddha nature that I've realized tells me that I am the way to life, uh, the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can come to the divine except through that level of consciousness. That's what he's saying, if, if I'm being clear here. That's what Jesus says. You have to attain this I am consciousness, which we find in the Bible when God speaks of God's self as the I am. You have to realize the I am in, with, and as yourself, which is the first point of perennial wisdom, first two points. And then 
And that's what he was saying. And no one comes to the ultimate reality of God except through this level of consciousness. And she was, I, I didn't convince her, <laughs> but she looked at me, she said, that's really interesting. I have to think about that. So that, that's the shift from a metaphysical affirmation that Jesus is it, you know, or the belief is similar to that, to taking it as a metaphor that Jesus is speaking parable often and parables should be read as metaphor. <clears throat> and when you shift from metaphysics to metaphor, you open up a plethora of, of alternative readings of these teachings and you just deepen your way of engaging with religion, I think. And you're not at war. You can be at war over beliefs. You can be at war over metaphysical affirmations, but you can't be at war over hypotheses and you can't be at war over metaphor because you can just pile them on top of one another and nothing is right or wrong. They're all just grist for the, the mill of spiritual exploration. So that's the second one. The third one is shifting from the parochial to the perennial. And they're all variations on the same thing. Parochial is when my, you know, it's my tribe, my group, you know, when Jews say we are the chosen people, you know, every, every time we read the, the Torah in a synagogue, you know, part of the blessing is Bachar Banu Mikol Ha'amim, that God chose us, the Jews, from among all the people of the world to receive the one and only revelation, because God from the Jewish point of view, the Gospels don't count, the Quran doesn't count, the Bhagavad Gita doesn't count, Dharmakaya, uh, uh, the Dhammapada doesn't count in Buddhism, Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. I mean, none of these are revelations. Only the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible is, is revelatory. So, and God chose us from among all the peoples to receive this singular revelation. That's tribal marketing. Right? I mean, that's like Coca-Cola saying it's the real thing. <laughs> you know? And by implication, Dr. Pepper is a quack and Pepsi is false. You know? It's the same. That's a great thing. analogy. You like that? Yeah, me too. So, so uh, you know, and, and you see this in every religion. So uh, Muhammad is the final prophet of God and the Quran is the final revelation of God. And Islam is God's last word on, on everything. So that when the Baha'i come on the scene centuries later, they're rejected out of hand because the Islamic tribe, if you like, has, has made any, any evolution in spiritual thought uh, has outlawed it. <clears throat> Christianity, when it says, you know, we, you know, there is no salvation outside the church that only Christians are saved. And then they fight amongst themselves, which Christians are saved and all that. But what I'm suggesting is that parochial religion, as natural as it is to human people, to human beings, it's time I'm hoping for most of us is either past or in the process of passing. And that we recognize you know, no, none of us, I'm assuming, very few of us, let me not be, let me not overestimate the capacity, let me not underestimate the human capacity for stupidity. But I don't know anyone who would go to war over loving Coke versus loving Pepsi. And that's just, you know, Pepsi and Coke will fight for shelf space, but they're not going to kill each other over it. Nobody is going to say, you can't marry that person because you know, she drinks Coke and we are a Pepsi family. I mean, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> so as people realize that, that parochial religious institutions are like Coke and Pepsi, then they begin to say, well, is it just, are they all the same? And that's not true either. I mean, to, to say they're all the same would be to do each of them a disservice. I don't want to make Christianity like Judaism or like Islam or, or reduce Hinduism to Buddhism or uh, that's that just dumbs down the human uh, creative spirit. I like all the variants because it, when you read them as metaphor because then it just gives you more avenues to explore what reality is knowing ultimately that like Lao Tzu says in the Tao Te Ching the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. In other words 
with all these metaphors, I still haven't got it because it, there's no way to, to put it in a box. So when we realize these parochial religions are not doing us any favors, we don't get rid of them, but we start to read them through the lens of the perennial. So then everything becomes how, then the discussion between religions is how does your religion articulate the non-dual reality of which we are all a part? And so you'll call it, you know, Godhead, uh, like in uh, Meister Eckhart, you know, in the Christian tradition. Um, and I'll call it uh, yud heh vav -Hey in the Jewish tradition. How, two different words with their own sphere of, uh, with, their, with their own understandings historically and otherwise, but they're both, like the Buddhists would say, fingers pointing toward the moon, like the Zen saying. But I'd like to know how that, how your finger articulates this shared reality. And then I'm just curious about your religion. And maybe I'll in integrate something from your tradition into my own practice. Uh, and then I want to know about your practice, because now that's how you test your hypotheses. You move back from metaphor, um, you move back from, from metaphor to, to hypotheses, and you can test the, the viability of your metaphor. So hopefully I haven't lost anybody in this because I get very enthusiastic. But that's the third shift is you go from the parochial to the perennial. And then within the perennial, you work on the metaphor and then you work on the hypothesis and you get to prove, because I think again, point number two of the four points of perennial wisdom, you can prove to yourself, by yourself, though it's nice to have teachers and a community that's testing the same things, but you can prove to yourself the truth or falsity of the notion that we are all part of a singular reality. Those are the shifts that need to happen if we're gonna overcome the divisions that parochial religion has invented and then imposed on us. Really, really. I mean, this is very deep, right? You know, an amazing amount of food for thought for people that have not gone there before. Yeah, you know, and I did it pretty fast, so. <laughs> you know. Hopefully. I'm sure it's, it's, it's very difficult where people have been so embedded and so ingrained in a certain set of beliefs or what have you. But, you know, it's, it's certainly incredible to me, very illuminating and uh, liberating. And um, as you've said, it motivates us to explore and, and try to understand better something quite frankly, in my mind that can't be, completely understood as humans yeah right eventually it's it's ineffable but we're human also we're we're human so we like to talk about these things uh but yeah sure it's it's fundamentally beyond our ability to articulate that's why it's it's metaphor and hypothesis you know it, it makes us it's humble do. yeah it makes us humble which is not something that parochial religions are prone to do exactly Exactly. That's a big, <laughs> important point right there alone. <laughs> yeah. So um, do you have any sense yet of, you know, post pandemic when you'll be able to start doing some of your retreats in person again? Well, the short answer is no, <laughs> uh, though there are feelers out. I, I know that one of the retreat centers that I go to is interested in starting up again in person in July. That's the earliest I've heard. Wow. Um, but most of the places that are reconnecting with me are still on Zoom. They're looking to be on Zoom for another year. And you know, maybe they're pushing stuff out to 2023 even. Mm. So it's, it's hard to say you know, how this is going to work for me. And it's hard to say if I'm willing to get on an airplane anymore. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I was a road warrior for, for the spirit. I was a spiritual warrior on the road all the time. And I, you know, I'm in my 70s and I'm going, do I really want to get in that long line and cram myself <laughs> into that airplane? COVID or no COVID? Am right, I right. Really, do I really want to do that? And the answer is, I'm not sure yet. Well, hopefully it'll evolve so that it's not, so singularly dependent upon you. Ah, uh, well, that's, that's, I mean, there's a lot of people doing what I'm doing, but, you know, I mean, if someone asks, can you come? And, and I, I have no, I can't say, well, I have some 
friends of mine who could do it instead. I mean, I don't, I don't have that. I, I'm just out here by myself. So if they ask me, it's either yes or no. And I just <laughs> haven't, haven't really decided. Uh-huh. Well, again, Rami, it's so wonderful to have you involved in this project. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate you helping us learn, you know, in this dimension um, that is oftentimes not considered. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I'm, I'm grateful that you asked and happy to, to have been able to say yes. Same here. Same here. Well, thank you again. And, um, you know, <clears throat> if anybody wants to learn more, uh, go check out you know, the one river foundation.org and, yeah, or they can, you know, I have my own website, rabbi Rami.com. So either way you can find out what I'm doing and they link together. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you.